Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy for the COVID-19 economy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. My guest today is David Bradbury, head of Tax Policy and Statistics Division of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. Prior to joining the OECD, David was a member of the House of Representatives in the Australian Parliament and a minister in the Australian government. Our topic today will be the fiscal responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we begin, uh, our usual bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, we encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event's being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website uh, in a couple of days. We're using captioning, which you can adjust or turn off with the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. Finally, if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Uh, David Bradbury, welcome to the prescription. It's great to have you. It's great to be with you, Helen. Thank you. Uh, much has been written and said about the world's public health responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, but relatively little attention has been paid to the fiscal policy responses to the COVID-19 economy. So I've asked you to help our mostly American audience learn something about the way other countries have responded to a worldwide economic slump. So let's start with the damage. There obviously was lots of variation among countries, both in terms of severity and timing. Uh, China, for example, was hit early and hard, but recovered relatively quickly. Uh, India was relatively immune early on, but is suffering very severely now. Overall, what did COVID do to the world economy in 2020? Thanks, Howard. Um, it, it had a significant and immediate impact. Um, and that's something that has been seen, um, was seen almost immediately after the onset of the pandemic. I think what we have also witnessed, though, is that um, many economies bounced back quite quickly, even though the, the pandemic and the health situation continued to be quite volatile and continues to be quite volatile. I think if you think about it, um, the, the start of 2020, um, around um, March, from March onwards, we really saw um, a, a number of economies almost um, sort of diving off the cliff, as it were, in terms of the impact, the immediate impact on GDP. Now, um, after having navigated the first wave, which took many different forms across different countries, we saw even in countries where they had been quite badly affected, we, we saw a bounce back. And that was as uh, the containment measures began to be lifted and eased and um, many of the constraints imposed to contain the virus, which were also having a, a very um, containing effect on growth. Uh, as they were eased, we saw a, a bounce back. Um, we, we, we are hoping, and certainly the, the forecast suggests that um, by about the, the end of next year, uh, we should be getting back to, to where we were before the crisis. But uh, the situation obviously is very volatile. And uh, what we're experiencing at the moment is some countries that are going into uh, their third, fourth and, and subsequent waves of the virus. The um, emergence of new variants is uh, posing a, another challenge. Uh, but I think the, the one bit of good news on the horizon is the, 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 va the vaccine, the availability of the vaccines. And I think we've seen, uh, particularly from those countries that have been able to rapidly deploy the vaccines, uh, the United States, um, the United Kingdom in particular, we've seen, uh, and, and Israel uh, is another very good example. Uh, we have seen in those um, economies that the economic benefits uh, of being able to rapidly deploy the vaccines are also being felt. So uh, we look, uh, as we move forward, we, we have some optimism that the vaccines will help us get there, but I guess the, uh, the uncertainty of this pandemic continues to prevail. So the, the, the parallel question to the, to the GDP issue is what happened to tax revenues? How badly were they hit? And, and similarly, are you beginning to see something of a bounce back in, in revenues? Yeah, so we, we would expect that revenues will take quite a bit longer to recover for a, a range of reasons. Just to, to, to step back for one minute and to think about uh, the, the various contributing factors at play here. So 
firstly, the containment measures that most economies, most governments put in place uh, suppress demand. Um, and in suppressing demand, uh, that has had an impact on uh, production, it's had an impact on consumption, uh, it's had um, a significant impact on, on growth generally. So those taxes that are linked uh, to a, a pro-growth environment have been somewhat suppressed. Um, we've also observed specifically in the area of consumption taxes um, that they have been even uh, more severely affected than perhaps in the past. And that's because the very targeted nature of some of the, the containment measures have really suppressed consumption in a, in a very significant way. So on the one hand, you have uh, the natural effects of um, the economic downturn on tax revenues. In addition to that, you also have uh, the effects um, of government spending, additional government spending and the pressures that that's putting on public finances. But then another dimension to this is that some of the immediate responses that governments have put in place have sought to uh, relieve or alleviate some of the tax burden on, on various actors in the economy. So there's policy change also reducing the amount of tax that's being collected. Um, now, just to, to highlight one particular point that will continue to play out as we move forward, uh, obviously, as we saw in the last major crisis, the, the global financial crisis, um, a lot of the losses that are being incurred, uh, particularly by, by businesses, will continue to uh, flow through in the, full, in the form of uh, the carrying forward of those losses into, into future income tax years. So we would expect these impacts to continue to uh, weigh on um, overall revenues of governments for some time to come. That said, we haven't yet really begun to, to see um, actual data. Our revenue st statistics uh, uh, data collection series that we have, uh, it will take some time before that starts to show up in the data, but certainly this is exactly what the countries are reporting to us. It's interesting you, you, you mentioned the, the, the effect on consumption and here in the US, you know, it's been an interesting experience because income taxes have held up surprisingly well, but sales tax revenue for state and local governments has plummeted. And it sounds like that, that's the same problem with, uh, with countries that rely very heavily on value added taxes, that those consumption tax revenues decline quite a bit. Yeah, no, look, that's definitely the case. And if you think about um, the, the broadly based consumption tax um, in most economies, when they were originally introduced, it was to try and capture services because uh, to a large extent, specific taxes on goods was a, a part of the, the, the tax base that had been relatively well addressed, if not in a, a uni uniform or, or standardised way. Uh, so a lot of the services sector have been very severely affected by the containment measures, uh, which by definition in the countries that have implemented them and implemented them aggressively, it's been about uh, reducing social interaction and social contact uh, and that has, uh, that has certainly uh, had an effect. So we, um, we, we uh, not that long ago, about, uh, about four months ago, we actually released a paper that was backward looking and looked back at the, the global financial crisis and um, had a look at the impact on uh, consumption tax revenues of that crisis. And um, we, we found that it was quite severe in terms of the immediate and um, subsequent year impacts on consumption taxes. Now, on top of all of that, in the current crisis, the, the specific containment measures stand to, um, to, to demonstrate that it's likely to be even worse. And, and, and certainly that's what countries are already reporting. Interesting. I wonder if some of that is, is mitigated by the move to online sales. Uh, while you can't go into your neighborhood retailer, you can buy online. Do you, you think that's going to have some, some effect, some mitigating effect? Uh, yeah, look, I, I think um, that there are some issues around um, the um, equal treatment of online sales versus sales from uh, uh, brick and mortar um, operations. Uh, now, to some extent, uh, many countries have been implementing measures to, to try and level the playing field in that respect. And uh, this is where some of the work we've been doing in VAT, not as relevant, obviously, in the, in the US um, situation, but um, one of the, the areas of work we've led there has been um, providing tools 
that governments could implement in order to tax um, low value uh, imports into their, into their jurisdiction. So the issue here was um, before these standards, um, most countries would have a de minimis amount or a, a threshold. And if goods were being purchased below that threshold, no VAT would be levied. And that was really a compliance cost saving measure. Um, but as the digital economy has, um, has expanded, that's become an increasingly significant part of the economy. Being able to tax uh, those transactions in the same way as we would tax uh, a purchase from the, the corner store is something that countries now have the tools to implement and have been implementing. In addition to that, uh, the tax on uh, taxes on cross-border digital sales through the VAT system have also been very effective in doing that. So th that has, I think, um, mitigated some of the impacts. But if you look at the consumption data generally, um, it, it is down. Um, yes, people may not be eating in the restaurants and they're getting home delivery and things of that nature, but overall uh, consumption has been down and, and that will certainly be reflected in consumption tax revenues. So let's talk a little bit about responses. Um, I've been looking through some of the data and it appears that many countries did enact some sort of pandemic relief for their residents. How widespread were tax cuts as a, as a, as a, uh, as, as a relief measure for, uh, yeah. for people? So it's, it's, uh, the way we try and think about the response is that there, there are several phases here. And, and obviously because of the evolution of the pandemic and uh, the variation, in its evolution from country to country. This is not necessarily a sequential or chronological process, but in general terms, we really think about the immediate emergency response. Then we think about measures that are targeted towards recovery and stimulus. And then there will be the wave of measures that will be targeted towards the resilience of the tax base and the fiscal position of the country moving forward. Now, um, when you're moving in and out of containment, <laughs> And lockdowns, as, as many countries have, sometimes you might be you might have your hand on a couple of hands on a couple of these levers at the same time. But if you begin with the emergency response measures, we, we've been tracking now for well over a year um, the measures that countries have been putting in place. And tax plays an important role. But what I think is worth noting is that um, tax is not the most important. Uh, lever that governments have sought to, to rely upon. The, the principal uh, focus of these response measures has been firstly to try and um, make sure that you could keep your businesses afloat, particularly those that the underlying fundamentals of the business are viable. It's just because of the, the containment measures that um, temporarily have put in, put, been put in place um, have made it difficult for those businesses. So it's about trying to protect the solvency of businesses that are temporarily going through those challenges. And then on the household front, it's really about providing the support to households, ensuring a level of social protection, particularly where the employment situation of individuals may well have been affected by the containment measures uh, as well. So in that regard, we see governments deploying many tools. Um, cash payments to households have been a very significant part of the response. Um, along with um, the, the various employment and labour market related measures. We've seen a range of furlough type schemes in place. We've also seen part, um, short, short time uh, work arrangements that have been put in place. So that's largely what we've been seeing um, for households in, that, in the um, non-tax area. And also for businesses in the non-tax area, a range of things around supporting um, their liquidity, financing, guarantees of debt, things of that nature. On the tax front, what we've seen has been more about um, timing questions, so about uh, delaying the payment of certain taxes, uh, deferring that so that um, the cash flow of the here and now can be dealt with, but without necessarily waiving the obligation to pay that tax. There have been some countries that have waived the obligations, um, but they've been in a very small minority. Um, but what you see almost universally is um, leniency in terms of uh, the filing of returns, um, considerable deferral of payments. Um, and in particular, we see a lot happening around um, the social security contribution space. So these are 
um, uh, payroll related taxes often from employers um, connected with their employees. Uh, very big in many parts of the country, uh, social security contributions. So we see a lot of, a lot of deferral happening there. Um, but to be honest, in the emergency response phase, we see very little in the way of, of actual tax cuts. There are some examples, but, but, but a very small minority. So that's interesting though, because of course here in the US, the way we distributed relief to families was through the tax code. Yeah. We, we, you know, our economic impact payments were actually were uh, advanced tax credits. Yeah. Um, and, and it created some distribution problems here. It sounds like what you're, you're suggesting is that most countries didn't do that, that the, the direct relief payments were actually just direct relief payments and, and not run through yeah. the tax code. Is that right? Yeah, generally that, that was the case. Um, although I should say that the, the architecture of the tax system in many countries was the vehicle through which the relief was delivered because often the systems are in place and you know for, for many advanced economies in particular it's either through the tax system or the transfer payment system and sometimes there's a strong connection between the two um, but but often um, in fact the majority of cases it was direct payments sometimes administered through the architecture of the tax system but not as uh, tax relief per se. And the principal reason for that is in most systems, it was, it was easier, easier and faster to get the support into the household's pockets through direct cash payments rather than through the tax system. I guess the challenge with any tax system, particularly with the personal income tax, which is typically uh, an annual, is, is acquitted on an annual basis, um, you know, there's this challenge of how do you get the money into people's pockets when they need it right now, when they may not be filing a return in the future. Now, there are ways you can do that, you know, advancing credits that might otherwise be made available. Uh, but for most systems, that actually proves to be a little bit more complicated than simply going down the cash payments route. And um, this is something that we see in the business space where um, it's often, you know, the idea of making cash payments to business is has less um, less support than it does directly to households. Um, but if you provide tax relief to businesses, once again, you've got this issue of if it's only coming to them when they file their return in the future, um, it may not be timely enough. Many businesses will file returns on more than an annual basis. So there is a little bit more flexibility there. But we've seen with the uh, introduction of things like um, acceleration of loss carryback arrangements, um, it, I think of one example in particular in New Zealand, what they did was they introduced loss carryback, which they didn't already have, mm. but they actually introduced it in a way where they would provide the benefit up front and then they would reconcile that in, the, in next year's tax return. Um, obviously, when you're doing things like that, the reconciliation process could then generate situations where people may have liabilities, additional liabilities, or you may have underdone the the, um, uh, the payment support. But I think, um, you know, in the emergency response phase, the priority everywhere was to get the money to where it was needed quickly. So this is a, this is a cash flow effort and we'll, we'll sort it out later. In effect. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I, I know it's, we're, we're still early days, but do you have a sense of, of which of these relief models was actually most effective in particular countries that, that you think did this particularly well, that are worth, should we go through this again, worth remembering? Look, I think um, the, the emergency relief phase, there actually was not a huge amount of variation across what countries did. I, I think there was variation in terms of the, you know, the, the quantity of the support that was provided, mm -hmm. but by and large, um, the, the, the support um, was delivered through similar delivery channels, if you like, um, and certainly in the tax space. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges with the emergency response, um, and a lot of this actually is not so much in the tax space, it's in the non-tax space, is the challenge of um, beginning to unwind that support in a targeted, a targeted manner that does not undermine the good work that had been provided in the support in the first instance. And, and this is something that we see, uh, particularly with support for businesses, um, unwinding that support and, and even employees through furlough arrangements 
um, you know, having those systems in place, there was um, a desire to overdo it rather than underdo it in terms of the support that was provided, which I think was on balance the right, the right approach in the circumstances. But then when you begin to unwind that or to try and target it, it becomes incredibly complex and difficult to, to do at that point. And then if you begin unwinding that support, and then the economy is subjected to further containment measures, which has also been the case, it becomes incredibly difficult and complex. So I think what we've observed for a number of countries is they've probably been inclined to leave more generous arrangements in place for longer than they um, had originally anticipated. Um, now, the, 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 the cost of that, the fiscal cost of that, obviously, uh, continues to mount. Um, but the complexity of unwinding that in a way that did not leave people short, I think, was, was something that was just, uh, you know, too difficult to, to manage. So, you know, having said, you know, is there a particular country? I think you could go through and you could look at particular countries and say, you know, they managed their furlough arrangements very well. You could look at another country and say, you know, they had a good um, uh, business loan guarantee arrangement in place. On the tax side of things, for the emergency response, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of um, heterogeneity in, in the nature of the response. Um, and I think that by and large, most governments that were trying to, to step in and, and, and assist did so and did so quite effectively. As you suggest, I, I, one of the challenges I think in the phase we're in now is, is what do governments do with businesses that are really just not going to make it? How long do they continue to offer support? And at what point do they just say, you know, we, 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 we just cannot continue to support you indefinitely and the market's going to have to just do what it does? Yeah, look, I think that's a, that's a really difficult question. And um, the, the, the thing that makes it even more difficult is that there are some sectors that continue to be more adversely affected than others. And what is not entirely clear to any of us is how much of that continues to be temporary or how much of that is beginning to become the new normal as well. Uh, and, and I just think, you know, just to, to think of one example, um, you know, with the, with the Oscars recently being in the news, you think about cinemas, you think about, you know, the, the, the almost fundamental shift that we've seen with, you know, streaming and people watching things um, from home. Um, you know, I, I, personally, I really have no idea whether the traditional cinema is going to, to bounce back and become the feature of our social and cultural lives that it has been for so long. Like, I think... You know, a lot of people would like to see it continue to be an important part of the future. But for government policymakers, those um, shaping, you know, the government response, it's incredibly difficult to be making a judgment about, you know, whether or not continued support uh, to help navigate these difficulties in the short term um, is, 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 is simply that, or is it actually now beginning to um, provide support to industries that structurally um, may not have the same sort of future that they had before the pandemic. Incredibly difficult. Uh, and, um, you know, behind all of these decisions are, you know, livelihoods of individuals. So incredibly difficult decisions for governments. Uh, and um, at a time when there is just such a lack of, of um, information and knowledge about what the future holds. So as you said, the, the, we, we seem to be in a little bit of a transition phase coming from that sort of a, a, a period of immediate relief, just getting money to people as quickly as possible. Here in the US, we think of it more as a, as a, a stimulus phase now. Um, President Biden, of course, is proposing a big infrastructure bill. Do you see that pattern now starting to happen in other countries? Is that transition beginning to happen? Yeah, so definitely. Um, and. Um, We've seen the response and the recovery working together because many economies have been going in and out of, uh, of lockdowns. But uh, certainly across the, across the globe, we've seen a number of these stimulus recovery type measures. Um, in Europe, for example, they had a very significant package, one of the first um, uh, areas to, to announce a major investment. Well, one of the things that we have tried to, to say to countries in, in helping them and guiding them with these decisions is um, a couple of things we think it's important to, to bear in mind. But one of the most important is 
that the decisions that you take today to stimulate the economy, you should be thinking about whether or not they align or conflict with the longer term decisions that you think you may have to be taking in the not too distant future. And um, that's not to say you're going to have to get your public finances in order down the track so don't spend any money. Otherwise, there would be a permanent conflict between these, these two propositions. But it's really about saying things like, we all know that our economies need to decarbonise. They need to um, begin the process of transition uh, for a future without a dependence on um, greenhouse gas emitting uh, production and consumption. And perhaps the decisions we take today to stimulate the economy and to stimulate demand may also be directed towards investments that may produce some longer term dividends uh, as part of that um, foreseen transition. Uh, so that's just one example. Um, I think that we can also see a range of other areas. You know, I think if we look at um, the, the, the recent uh, package um, in the US, the, the American Families Package, if I've got the name correct, I think it's I think it was Rescue Jobs and Families Package, but uh, the Families Package, um, a number of investments there in, in social infrastructure, I guess you would say, in, in education, um, in um, care. Uh, these are, if, if your longer term objectives are to build resilience through your society, through investments in these areas, then it actually does make sense to be making those investments at the time that you're looking to to stimulate activity and, and, and generate some demand. So, you know, there, there is no right and wrong answer across economies that the needs um, and the, the situation will be different from economy to economy. But, you know, our view is you should not be taking those short-term recovery decisions in isolation of where you think your, your country needs to be heading moving forward. Let, let me ask you, 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 you hit on one point that I think is important to think about. Many of the countries that were spending money to provide this relief didn't really have the fiscal capacity to do that. Uh, they already had significant debt. Now that debt is 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 worse. What are the long term consequences of of uh, of co the COVID economy and the, and the fiscal response to it? I think they they vary from from country to country. And uh, what we've seen is countries that have central banks that have had the ability to um, carry some of the load. Uh, through this period have a lot more fiscal firepower than those that have not been in that situation. So um, very, very different from country to country. I, I think um, regardless of, of where you are in, in that um, continuum of, of, of variation, uh, I would be suggesting that um, this has been such a significant and disruptive sequence of events that we really need to be using this as an opportunity to be reflecting upon the settings across our tax and spending systems generally with a view towards what are our aspirations for our economies, our societies in the future? And do we have our tax and spending systems properly aligned with what we'd like to do in the longer term? Now, um, for many countries, over the medium to longer term, that will involve increasing taxes uh, to, to support uh, additional expenditure and to support uh, the paying down of, of debt, um, but not for all countries. But I think it really is important that people begin to think about the longer term challenges beyond this crisis, if we can be so bold as to think there will be a period beyond it. Um, and in thinking about those, begin to think about whether we have the tax and spending systems that are fit for purpose. And you know, there's a whole range of things there. Um, at the OECD, we've been saying for a long time, um, greater focus on environmentally related taxation. It's got to be a part of the story. We think um, more stronger and more effective taxation of capital income and capital gains, um, not just from a revenue raising perspective, but from an inclusive growth perspective. Um, that's got to be a part of the story. Um, and I think we need to be thinking about uh, whether or not our tax systems across all taxes, all tax bases, are fit for purpose in a, a digitalizing economy where that digitalization has only been accelerating through this pandemic and will continue, we think, into the future. Well, David, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um,
I was hoping to ask you a little bit about the uh, efforts to create a workable multilateral system for corporate taxation, but I guess that's going to have to wait. Um, we understand OECD hopes to have a solution to that by summer, so maybe we'll have you back in the summer. We can talk about that. Thank I'd, you again I'd so much I'd for love, joining us. I'd love to be back if, uh, if there's an opportunity, but thanks very much, Alan. Absolutely. Thank you, and thanks to the audience for joining us as well.